Okay, so I think we're going to get started today. Um, everybody, thank you for making it to the PACVAC seminar series. We have two excellent speakers lined up today. The first is Vincent Mai, who's a, a trainee from San Francisco State University. He's a master's student in biology at, um, in the Sway Lab. Uh, he's completed his Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Sciences at Seattle University and is interested in using host species analysis to develop spatial models of human PCTF risk that may directly inform public health practices. He hopes to find a professional career working in vector disease control after completing his master's degree. So um, without any further ado, Vincent, if you'd like to um, lead us through your talk, that would be excellent. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for that introduction, Crystal. So thank you all for coming here today where I'll be talking about my project on the distribution and ecology of the emerging tick-borne pathogen Rickettsia 364D. But before I jump into talking about my project specifically and my pathogen, I wanted to talk a little bit about the emergence of vector-borne diseases as a whole. So um, emerging diseases is an increasing problem worldwide and um, of those emerging diseases, 22% of all emerging diseases are actually um, vector-borne zoonotic diseases, which means they are transmitted often by an, an arthropod vector um, before infecting humans. Um, of these vector-borne, emerging vector-borne zoonotic diseases, um, ticks actually harbor the most, the highest number of diseases of any other arthropod vector, um, including mosquitoes. And that's mainly due to this genus. If you look over to this um, bar graph over here, this genus Rickettsia, um, which is a genus that is, is a genus of bacteria that harbors just an incredible amount of diversity um, and is the reason why ticks um, have more emerging vector borne diseases than mosquitoes. Um, so, talking more about the genus Rickettsia. Um, they're a diverse genus of gram-negative bacteria, and they're medically important worldwide. They're the cause of human ehrlichiosis, as well as anaplasmosis and spotted fever group rickettsiosis. They are all obligate intracellular parasites, which is why they often live in arthropod vectors, such as lice, mites, chiggers, fleas, and ticks. And they're severely understudied, especially compared to um, other tick-borne uh, bacteria, such as uh, the etiological agent of Lyme disease. Um, if you look at these um, maps here, um, I just wanted to show these because they show um, how widespread and diverse the genus is. So um, all of the symbols that are colored indicate rickettsia of known pathogenicity. Um, all of the black and white symbols indicate rickettsia of either unknown or suspected pathogenicity. Um, and this paper was published in 2005, so there are a lot of symbols here that um, should now should be colored because they um, are known human pathogens. Um, the disease I'll be talking about today is actually represented by this rectangle, this black and white rectangle here in California. Um, and it's designated here as unnamed rickettsia, but I think in 2005 it was, um, it became known that this uh, bacteria cause the human disease Pacific Coast Tick Fever. Um, and every time researchers have looked into this genus, they find more and more bacteria and more and more human pathogens. So it's, a, it's definitely understudied and there's a lot going on in this genus. Um, and then before I jump into Pacific Coast Tick Fever specifically, I also wanted to talk about Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, um, mainly because it's caused by the same bacteria or a very very, very close um, genetic relative, depending on who you ask, um, but it's caused by the bacteria Rickettsia rickettsii. Um, Pacific Coast Tick Fever, I'll designate as uh, Rickettsia 364D, um, short, because I'm naming it by its genotype. So if I want to say the whole name, it would be Rickettsia rickettsii uh, 364D, but I'll say 364D for short. Um, these diseases have some things in common, right? So they're both caused by Rickettsia rickettsii, um, they're both transmitted by uh, ticks in the genus Dermacenter, and both diseases present nonspecific symptoms, such as a fever, um, a headache, feelings of weakness, uh, muscle fatigue, um, that 
can often make it difficult to diagnose based on these nonspecific symptoms alone. Um, but they also differ in some really key ways. So Pacific Coast Tick Fever is transmitted by Dermacenter occidentalis, or the Pacific Coast Tick, and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is transmitted by two species of ticks, um, Dermacenter variabilis, the dog tick, or Dermacenter andersonii, the Rocky Mountain Wood Tick. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is also a very serious disease. So if untreated, it can be fatal within eight days of symptoms onset. Um, it's also characterized uh, mainly by the presence of this widespread spotted or pinpoint rash. Um, you can see a photo of what that looks like on this patient's, on the picture of this patient's foot here. Um, and the distribution is also different. So um, as you can see, um, based on the distribution of these two ticks, um, it's possible to have um, cases in all 50 states in the U.S., but we mainly see cases occurring in Arkansas, Missouri, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia. And these five states alone account for over 50% of the human cases we see every year. Um, now let's compare that to Pacific Coast Tick Fever. So the symptoms that occur um, the nonspecific symptoms like the fever and headache are often much more mild. Um, and we also don't see the spotted or pinpoint rash. Um, instead, we see um, what's known as an eschar, um, which is a necrotic lesion, meaning the, the skin tissue dies and um, kind of turns black and doesn't heal properly. And it looks like this photo here, down here, that, over here. Um, and this is an emerging disease that mainly occurs in California. If you look at this map from the Paget, from the Paget et al. paper published in 2016, we can see which California counties have ticks, uh, Dermacenter occidentalis ticks that have tested positive in green, um, negative in blue, and then you can see the number of human uh, Pacific Coast tick fever confirmed cases um, symbolized by these red numbers here. Um, here where I am in the Bay Area, um, we do have a bit of a hot spot with seven um, confirmed human cases occurring in Lake County alone. Um, and this is how we'll, um, this is one way that we'll be focusing our um, surveying efforts by looking at um, cases, uh, looking at counties that have confirmed human cases or counties that neighbor um, counties with confirmed human cases. But I'll get into that more later. Um, so we don't know very much about Pacific Coast tick fever, um, especially with regards to its zoonotic cycle because it's an understudied and emerging disease, but we know a few things. So we know that it's caused by the bacteria Rickettsia 364D, and this was first identified as a cause of illness in 2010 by Shapiro et al. Um, it's transmitted by the Pacific Coast tick, Dermacenter occidentalis, and some vertical transmission is known to occur, but the rates are too low to explain such high infection prevalences that we see in the environment. Uh, this leaves me with a key or un unresolved question. That is how and where is the pathogen maintained? One theory is that a vertebrate reservoir or amplifying host is suspected, but this is unknown at the time. Um, so I've condensed this key and resolved question into two main research questions to guide my project. Um, the first is, what are the vertebrate hosts responsible for maintaining Rickettsia 364D in California? Um, and can we use what we know about the infected vector and host reservoir distributions to analyze the pathogen's distribution and um, make predictions about who that amplifying host may be? In order to do this, I am targeting the common known host species of Dermacenter occidentalis. So um, which mammals are feeding uh, Dermacenter occidentalis ticks. And this is mainly um, species, like small species of rodents, such as the wood rat and deer mice, as well as some squirrel species, the Douglas squirrel, uh, the California ground squirrel, and um, some lagomorphs, such as the jackrabbit and cottontails. Um, from these species, I'll be collecting host tissue um, and testing them using molecular methods. And I'm also going to be using these species as the focus of my spatial analysis. Um, because 
Dermacenter oxtemlis is a understudied tick species. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research um, and formal surveys that look at DIOC from a disease standpoint. Right? So to get some background on Dermacenter oxtemlis, we had to go to these field guides. Um, this is the Ticks of California book, um, a table from the Ticks of California book. Um, and it just shows different host species, and then the number of adult nymphal and larval ticks, um, adult nymphal larval deoc ticks collected off of each host species. So um, we're interested mainly in um, the nymphal and larval life stages because these are the life stages that are most relevant to disease transmission. Um, and we wanted to see which hosts were holding um, a disproportionately high number of nymphal and larval ticks. Um, Keep in mind, this is not a um, like a systematic survey or anything. This is just kind of um, generalized um, field surveys or um, like it's uh, more like insect related knowledge. So um, some hosts that stood out from this table is are the California ground squirrel, um, Spermophilus beachy, um, the Douglas squirrel, Tamiascurus douglasi, um, as well as Paramiscus and Neotoma species. So we wanted to include these mammals in our molecular and spatial surveys. The other paper that kind of laid the groundwork down for this project um, is the Ecology of Tick-Borne Agents in California, published by Bob Lane in 1981. So um, Bob Lane and his colleagues in 1981 um, used serology, where they looked at um, sp spotted fever group complement fixing antibodies, and they looked at um, titers, excuse me, looked at titers that were relevant to, um, or that would indicate a previous history of infection. And what they found was that lagomorphs um, had especially high cross-reactivity with spotted fever group complement fixing antibodies. So uh, we also wanted to include lagomorphs in our study. Um, so for my molecular survey, I'm starting out with mammal tissue from Sway Lab, uh, from the Sway Lab collection, as well as collaborators, such as um, folks at the CDPH. Um, and I'm also looking at mammal tissue from banked museum collections, such as the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology in Berkeley. From these sources, I'm extracting DNA using a Kaijin DNA kit, and then performing genetic testing for 364D on the DDPCR platform using an existing qPCR platform that I ported over um, to the DDPCR platform. With any positives, I'm performing an OMPA semi-nest PCR um, in order to confirm them by sequencing. And from there, I will be able to determine the likely amplifying host based on these molecular surveys. Um, so far, I've tested about 247 individuals, um, and I've found three positives on the DDPCR. Um, all of these have occurred in ground squirrel. Um, two of them were found in ground squirrel from LA County and one from um, Santa Barbara County. Um, these are still awaiting co confirmation by sequencing. So uh, I can't say for sure if these are um, for sure positives based on that AMPE PCR. Um, but in addition to these, we also have 111 samples still in our collection um, to test. And these include more species of lagomorphs, such as Civil Lagus bachmani um, and Lupus californicus, and as well as more squirrel species, um, mainly from Banks Museum specimens at the MVZ, as well as our collaborator at the California Health and Food Safety Lab. Um, but for now, um, our main suspect, I would say, is the California ground squirrel, um, but we can't eliminate any of these other mammals because um, our surveys haven't either haven't covered them or haven't been sufficient to say otherwise, but um, it's a little bit like looking for a needle in a haystack in this project. So um, this is our best guess so far, but um, I'm still working on confirming this by sequencing. But in addition to our, my molecular survey, I'm also performing a spatial analysis. So in order to do that, I'm starting out with tick occurrence data along with their 364D infection status. Um, I'm also using world-clim bioclimatic data and vertnet mammal occurrence points. 
Um, I made sure to use VertNet um, mammal occurrence points that were related to an existing museum specimen, specimen of some sort. So um, I removed any um, occurrence points that were related to something like a citizen science um, observation or INAT observation point. From there, I used Maxent model building methods to create two sets of maps. Um, the first set of maps are essentially maps of the ticks. So um, I used uh, positive ticks to create a map that predicts an infected niche. And then the second set of maps I'm making are of potential amplifying hosts. So um, the mammal species that um, I mentioned earlier. From there, I'm comparing the rasters using various niche overlap metrics. Um, and I'll be able to determine the amplifying hosts using this methods based on their predicted spatial distribution. So in order to create a maxent model, I needed tick occurrence points. Um, and then to map the infected niche, I needed their Rickettsia 364D infection status. Um, thanks to Bob Lane at the CDC and Carrie Padgett at the CDPH for sharing their um, data with me, I was able to obtain 9,000 tick occurrence points along with their 364D infection status. Um, I plotted them on a map and removed any redundant um, or non-unique localities, and I found that they represented about 256 unique localities. Um, from there, I spatially thinned them to a 10 kilometer radius to um, mitigate sampling bias, and they represented about 132 unique localities after that. Um, this was done because when you go out and drag for ticks, you generally go and look for look at areas that you would expect to find ticks, um, so they aren't collected randomly. Um, the other thing that Maxent needs are these environmental variables. Um, for that, I went to BioClim um, and used these uh, various environmental um, input data sets to build my model. Here are the um, tick, tick species distribution models that I made. Um, the first one is the total niche of Dermacenter occidentalis. Um, and then the map on the right-hand side is the infected niche. So um, the same map, but using only um, 364D positive Dermacenter occidentalis ticks. Um, something to note when looking at these two maps is that it appears that the infected niche makes up a smaller subsection of the total niche. And this is congruent with the theory that an amplifying host may be responsible because there could be some mammal species that lives in some areas of the tick niche um, and is amplifying the infection, but doesn't, um, doesn't live in the total niche of Dermacenter occidentalis. Um, now, these are the maps of the potential amplifying hosts. Um, I've only made two so far, but I'm planning to make more. Um, the first map here is the map of the ground squirrel or of the predicted distribution of the ground squirrel, um, Autospermophilus beachy. And from there, I ran a correlation matrix in order to generate this correlation coefficient um, with that compares the infected niche with the potential amplifying host. And it found that the correlation between these two were, was 0.6, uh, which is pretty high. Um, and then I did the same thing for the California jackrabbit, and it it came up with a correlation coefficient of 0.76, which is um, which also appears very high. Um, this isn't a very um, sophisticated statistical method, um, so I'm I'm still working on it and hoping to use more. Um, rigorous statistical methods in the future. Um, this is kind of where I'm at on the spatial side. And I found a package that uh, Dan Warren made called ENM Tools. Um, and he has a bunch of niche overlap metrics, um, things like background tests that I'm hoping to use to um, kind of put these um, maps of the potential amplifying host through more rigorous statistical methods in order to determine um, the host based on these predicted spatial distributions. Um, that's all I have for you today, um, but I'd like to thank everyone who made this project possible, including um, Sarah Billiter at the CDPH, Megan Saunders at the CDC, um, Michelle Koo, um, Javier, who 
um, got me some samples at the California Health and Food Safety Lab, Chris Conroy at the MVZ. Um, Arthur Lee is a friend of mine who's a hunter and he went out and like donated some jackrabbit that he found when he was out pheasant hunting, um, as well as everyone at SF State who's helped me with this project. All right, thank you. That was a, that was a great presentation. Um, I'm more on the mosquito side of things, so I really enjoy hearing these tick presentations. Um, does anybody, I'll open it up for questions now. You either want to ask uh, verbally or in the chat. And Chris? Well, I can't seem to get my video to work, but that's fine. Um, I was just going to ask you, I, like Crystal, I've thought about mosquitoes a lot more than ticks, but um, one of the things we run into in California with the bioclimatic variables is that some of the summaries of precipitation have quantities like annual rainfall, but when our rainfall occurs in relation to the seasonality of the vectors really matters a lot. And in the mosquito case, of course, it's like the reciprocal. We get winter rains, and then when the mosquitoes are maximally reproductively active, that's in the summer when we have almost no rainfall. And I'm curious how the bioclimatic variables capture that in terms of tick biology. Yeah, so um, let me go back to that with all of the... Um, so besides um, using things like, temp like precipitation and temperature seasonality, um, I am also trying to use um, layers that are related to the soil because that's where the ticks are living. Um, and things like soil organic carbon um, density can predict things like how um, moist the soil will stay, you know, even after a long period without rain um, because, you know, carbon is really what's holding all of that water in the soil. Um, so uh, there's also things like available soil water capacity until wilting. Um, I'd like to get something like a something related to leaf litter, because leaf litter also plays a huge role for ticks, um, because ticks are at risk of desiccation during the really hot summers. And that's really their main um, concern, you know, before getting onto their host is, um, are they going to desiccate first, or are they going to find a host for their blood meal? Yeah. All right. Um, Scott Campbell has a question in the chat. It says um, He says, great presentation. What animal tissues are you testing for the pathogen? Um, so, so far, all of the animal tissue that we've been testing have been uh, ear punches and blood. Um, in So let me go back to that table. Yeah, so everything that I've gotten from um, the Sway Lab has been ear tissue. Um, and then we also have some blood samples and uh, more ear tissue from the CDPH. Um, from the from MVZ, it's also mainly ear tissue, but they also have some frozen um, organ tissues that I haven't tested yet. So things like liver or spleen. And then um, same with California Health and Food Safety Lab, they have some formalin fixed um, like liver or spleen tissues that I'll, I will be testing. Good variety there. Okay, it looks like we have another um, hand up. Um, I'm probably going to say your name wrong and I apologize. Um, uh, Jianmin? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, so um, as I recall that you test 270 individual mammals and only three are positive for uh, the 364D and the low infection rate of 0 0.011. I was wondering whether this is typical for other Rickettsia pathogens, or whether that is uh, is really low infection rate in mammals. Hmm. Well, I'm not actually sure about that. About that. So, um, for Rickettsia 364D, we don't know, right? Because it's um, we don't really know what the mammal host is. But I would assume that for things like uh, Rickettsia rickettsii or um, other uh, rickettsial pathogens that um, are, hmm, I would also expect it to be low. You know, even even things like rickettsia, rickettsii in areas where the infection prevalence um, is higher, uh, I would think that in mammals it would still be pretty low because 
um, from what I remember about Rickettsia rickettsii, um, it's mainly um, amplified by the like, it's mainly the re the main reservoir is the tick. Um, it's not really amplified by other mammal species, um, and the it's they're still relatively rare diseases. That's a good question. Thank you. All right, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, Carrie Paget has her hand up. Hi, Vincent. This is Carrie. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Carrie. Hi. Um, terrific talk, and you know, obviously, I um, think this is a great topic. And you know, your finding of the beaches ground squirrels um, positive. That was, you know, really, um, you know, really seminal for this work of trying to figure out the, you know, the really, the, the whole cycle of this um, pathogen. Um, so the, the three um, beachy ground squirrels that you have listed on this slide that you're showing right here, I think, I think it was collected by Marco Metzger and Sarah Billiter. Um, were there other animals at that site or could you go back to that site to see if maybe, you know, other animals in that area might have similar prevalences of infection? Because that might be a really good um, spot to see if, you know, really, you know, focusing on ground squirrels is really the best idea, or maybe maybe rabbits too, or maybe it's similar among whatever, you know, vertebrate um, lagomorph or rodent is, is present in a, in a spot. Yeah, that would be a great idea. Um, those were, yeah, like you said, they were given to us by Sarah Billiter or by, I think, Mark, you said. Um, and I'm not sure if they collected other mammals from that area, but that's that's what they sent up to us. Um, but they have, like, you know, what campground within that county it was collected from. So it could be worth looking more at that specific park. Okay. I think we're going to try to squeeze in one more question that was in the chat. Um, there are... Um, are there vector competence studies on dermacentra occidentalis and rickettsia 364D that you know of? Um, not that I know of. Really, the, the even like the closest thing to that uh, was that um, paper, the Bob Layton paper from 1981, where they looked at um, serology. But I don't know any vector competency papers on it. Well, great job. Thank you so much for presenting. And uh, with that, we're going to move on to our next speaker. So <clears throat> if um, Jeremiah Reyes could take the, could share uh, your screen, please. Okay. So first, um, Jeremiah, did I say your last name correctly? Can you hear me now? Oh, there we go. Yes, now I can hear you. Yeah, Jeremiah Reyes. Yes, ma'am. Reyes. Okay, excellent. So um, just a quick inter introduction. Uh, Jeremiah, Jeremiah Reyes is a PhD student in biochemistry at the University of Nevada in Reno. Uh, Jeremiah completed his BS in chem chemical engineering with a biomedical emphasis and mathematics minor at UNR. His primary research interests are identifying anti-tick vaccine targets using multi-omics tools. Jeremiah's long-term goal is to pursue work as a military medical entomologist or work in the public health sector as a vector biologist. So I really look forward to this talk. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. I appreciate it. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining in on my talk today. Uh, I would like to give special thanks to uh, PACVEC for this wonderful opportunity of being here and their generous grant. Um, I'm part of the Biochemistry and Molecular Biology program here at UNR, and I'm under the direction of my mentor, Dr. Monica Galinas. And today I'll be going over the population genetic structure of the Western black-legged tick, Exodes pacificus. Uh, all right, so first I'd like to introduce uh, the organism I, I work with, which is the uh, Western black-legged tick, Exodes pacificus. Um, as seen by this figure over here on the lower right, this hard tick is found all along the western coastal states, such as California, Oregon, and Washington, as well as parts of the interstates, such as Idaho, Utah, Nevada, and Arizona. 
uh, Exodes pacificus has many hosts, such as deer, mice, birds, and lizards, just to name a few. And it is known to transmit many pathogens. Um, one of the most notable ones is uh, it being the principal vector for Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the causative agent of Lyme disease along the Western United States. And because of uh, the dynamic climate found throughout all of the Western US, um, ticks need to adapt to uh, post prevalence and the climate of that respective area. So why is it important to study this organism? Uh, well, we can at least uh, start with one aspect. If uh, we recall that it is the major vector for Lyme disease in the Western US, Overall, there is an increase in Lyme disease cases throughout the United States, as depicted here between the left and right image, with roughly about 400,000 cases per year. In the East Coast, we see this abundance of cases primarily in the Northeast region. Um, and as well as in the upper Midwest, uh, where Exodes scapularis is the major vector carrying the Borrelia spirochetes. Uh, the range of both of these ticks has increased over time, um, of which Exodes scapularis has even now been established as far as North Dakota. Now, in uh, looking more uh, uh, closely at Exodes scapularis, uh, my mentor, Dr. Uh, Gulianus, she conducted a genome-wide SNP analysis using 82 uh, individuals and generating a rad RADSeq library from eight geographical locations as depicted by these little dots over here um, and two laboratory colonies. And what came from this work was the identification of five distinct genetic clades um, as denoted by the different colors over here on this figure. But interestingly enough, we see that Virginia, this uh, guy over here um, uh, was found to be uh, mixed between one of the more northern and southern clades. So um, our question was what was going on with this Virginia cluster? Uh, so uh, the postdoc, Dr. Arvind Sharma and myself assisted uh, Dr. Jory Brinkerhoff from the University of uh, Richmond in preparing a RADSeq DNA library from over a hundred individuals throughout multiple counties. This was followed by Dr. Brinkerhoff conducting uh, RADSeq SNP detection with results showing a distinct ancestral population more closely to the uh, Northern groups, uh, which are found in the more mountainous location of, uh, locations of the state. And then a second ancestral population along the more, uh, uh, the, along the coastal area more closely related to, this, um, to these uh, Southern groups. And it was really interesting to, uh, to see this genetic diversity in one state alone. And now that we answered uh, some of these questions for Exodes scapularis, we went on to realize that um, information on the population structure for the Western black-legged tick is still unknown. Which brings us into the state of California. Uh, there's so much diverse terrain from the Northern and southern uh, coastal regions to the Sierras on the eastern side bordering Nevada and even these valleys in between. Uh, we have seen that ticks are found along all these distinct vegetations and areas along the state and there are studies which have looked at genetic diversity of Exodes pacificus along the west coast but none of which have uh, targeted this all of this region uh, recently. And that brings me to my goals and objectives for this project. So uh, my first aim is to determine the population genetic structure of Exodes pacificus using a genome-wide SNP analysis. And my second aim is to identify pathogens associated with different Exodes pacificus populations. Uh, so this particular paper here is uh, from 1997, uh, making it about 24 years old. And it didn't target as many genetic markers due to the technology that was available during that time. Uh, they looked at 10 separate counties um, denoted by these arrows over here. And um, overall, what they found was that Exodes pacificus exhibits a high gene flow. And these data also showed a weak relationship between gene flow and geographic distance. 
which uh, suggests rapid and recent range expansion. So in order to begin this study, we first had to develop our RADSEQ library. We uh, first either uh, received ticks from our collaborators throughout California, or we went out to the field and collected them ourselves. Then each individual tick uh, is mechanically homogenized um, using a mortar and pestle and liquid nitrogen inside of our Epidorf tube. This was followed by DNA extraction using the phenol chloroform method. And finally, we would run these samples on a gel and we would begin our Illumina short read prep using only those samples which gave high molecular weight DNA as shown by this figure right here. We then digested this DNA with uh, restriction, the restriction enzyme SBF1 and ligated the individual barcodes for each individual sample. And then we uh, pulled them all and then PCR amplified our library which consisted of 96 individuals from 10 separate counties. So here we can see the 10 counties that um, we have uh, worked with so far. So um, we have Mendocino, um, Alameda, Santa Clara, San Mateo, Santa Cruz, Santa Barbara, um, El Dorado, Placer, Sacramento, and uh, Nevada County. And um, we received that raw data and conducted the quality control, um, demultiplexed these individuals since they were all pulled together. And then um, uh, this, this was followed by a, a de novo reference assembly. Since we do not have a reference genome for Exodi specificus, we converted these reads to SAM files using SAM tools and then used GSTACs to identify our SNPs. And then finally, we used the program populations for our population structure statistics and analysis. So um, uh, this was ran on two lanes and we received roughly uh, 94 and 97 million reads and our raw data had a FRED quality score greater than 30. So these, wow, these ran pretty well. Um, uh, then we identified uh, 781,571 loci and um, after doing some, uh, uh, using the single writing signal SNP flag per loci, uh, we got 34,404 variant sites. And after further filtering, we got a total of 18,490 private alleles. So these are alleles that are only found um, specific to each one of these counties. So now what we saw firsthand with, from our um, FST, uh, it shows that these populations from all these counties show low to uh, moderate variation. And uh, you may ask, what is FST? Well, it is the proportion of the total genetic variance um, contained in a subpopulation uh, relative to the total genetic variance of all the samples. Um, it's a measure of population substructure and is uh, most useful for examining the overall genetic divergence among all these subpopulations. And it's really interesting to see because we see that most variation, uh, most variation occurs between Mendocino and other counties. So uh, this is our Mendocino over here and obviously it's separated out from these other groups and uh, as well as Santa Barbara and its other counties. So it's got that uh, moderate uh, variation as well. And then uh, there's low genetic variation between our counties found around the Bay Area, such as Alameda, Santa Clara, San Mateo. Uh, and then we see a similar trend with the samples uh, from Nevada, Placer, and El Dorado County. So those are these guys over here. So you have your Nevada, Sacramento, Placer, and El Dorado. And then you have your San Mateo, Alameda, Santa Clara as well right there. And then um, in order to see whether these subpopulations were inbreeding or outbreeding, we looked at genetic variation between individuals in their respective counties. And so what you, uh, you uh, use uh, FIS and uh, with these values all being positive and very close to zero, 
uh, it suggested that um, we had random mating among these individuals within these respective populations. So really interesting stuff so far. And uh, with that, um, what we have done so far uh, for our AIM-1 in uh, determining population genetic structure of Exodi specificus using genome-wide SNP analysis, uh, we've uh, gone on to collect these ticks from these northern and southern coastal regions, as well as along the Sierra Nevadas. And we've worked with collaborators to obtain more samples to cover more counties. Uh, we completed our first RADSeq library, which consists of 96 individuals in 10 counties. And our data so far shows a uh, low to moderate genetic variation among these populations, which uh, suggests a high gene flow among uh, these populations. And we're doing ongoing work to cover more counties. Um, for our future plans, our collaborators and lab members plan to cover as many sites in California as possible. And our data uh, will help us expand into a more multi-state population structure of Exodes pacificus. And finally, with AIM-2, identification of pathogens associated with um, these different populations of Exodes pacificus, um, those sequences that did not align to the, our de novo reference file will be used for uh, searching up signatures of tick-borne pathogens um, in our data set. And with that, I'd like to give my acknowledgments to uh, Dr. Gulian uh, with her mentorship and expertise and assisting me with this project, as well as uh, Dr. Andrew Nuss and Dr. Sharma, as well as Dr. Brinkerhoff um, with the uh, Virginia uh, side, of, uh, side of this project. Um, Molly uh, helped with collecting and maintaining the ticks and assisted with DNA extractions. And uh, our undergrads, uh, Bella collected some ticks for us in the Bay Area, um, Saranj and Randeep for assisting in our colony maintenance, and all of our collaborators from all these diff uh, all these vector control districts and public health divisions. Obviously, without them, this project would not be possible. And I'd like to give once again a big uh, thanks to PACVEC for giving me this opportunity to conduct this research, and uh, for their uh, generous funding. And with that, do I have any questions? Yeah, excellent job. This is super important work. Um, let's see, so we'll open it up for questions. And I'll start with the first question. <clears throat> so I noticed in the map um, that you presented that had the, your different counties that you were looking at, uh, they were colored in green. And yes. for, I'm um, so Santa Barbara County includes the um, Channel Islands National Park. Uh, so we are uh, receiving samples from our, so that um, the professor I did that project with uh, from uh, Virginia, Dr. Jory, he has some samples from Channel Islands. So we're expecting those. Those are not part of this library yet. Those are going to be part of our second library. Okay. So what do you expect that you're going to see when you incorporate those? I mean, I know that there is, um, or I think that there's probably uh, some probably migration of birds or something that might be going between um, the, these uh, southern coastal regions. So, um, I, but I do believe that it's going to at least maybe be in the higher variation portion. So just because it's more secluded from everywhere else, so. Okay. Let's see, so it looks like Chris has a question. Yeah, I was curious from an evolutionary standpoint, clearly these ticks have in some cases a three-year life cycle, which presents maybe limited opportunities for evolution compared to mosquitoes, for example. Right. And it looks like your work and the Lane study from 1997 pointed to high gene flow as an explanation for the homogeneity across the state. And I'm curious if an alternative explanation might be that the evolution is slower and if the evolutionary pressures are relatively homogeneous, that there could have been some sort of founder population in the West that slowly colonized the entire state. And um, what looks like hygiene flow and homogeneity from that standpoint is actually just slow evolution of the population. Um, that, that's a good point. I mean, that could probably be something we could 
um, we could look at or identify uh, once we get more of the more coverage along all of the state of California. Because uh, 10 counties, we did start with just like um, these different areas, but um, we're hoping to expand to expand this project to all of the state of California. And that's, that's the goal. So that's a really be nice word. One of the answers we could ask, one of the questions we can answer later on. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we have another question um, from uh, Jian Min. Oh, yes. Uh, so I believe that you, when you construct the rat sequence uh, library, that you use PCR to amplify, um, you know, the sequences. And I was wondering whether uh, when the efficiency of PCR amplification, whether they differ from one region versus another region. In other words, whether your um, genetic variation data could be possible affected by unlinear amplification between different regions. So what we do to make sure that we have everything equal is be when we set up the library, we make sure to use the same amount of DNA from each individual and the same amount of, so we standardize it all before, before we pull all the samples and run the uh, library. So that's why we wanted to get, one of our counties, obviously uh, we only have 96 barcodes. So one of them had to have the six, but other than that, we have 10 samples from each one of these counties and um, we're, we standardized them all to the same uh, concentration that was going into the library prep. It looks like um, Nikos has a question. Hi, Jeremiah. Yeah, just um, comparing the genetic uh, lack of what, what I perceive as kind of pretty low uh, differences, right, between the uh, far uh, locations uh, there. Just wondering if um, you looked at or you would might consider a comparison with microbiome differences between the ticks. There were some studies done, you know, similar to this on, on the East Coast with tick populations and comparing microbiome profiles and clearly showing as distance uh, increased microbiomes differed between your different populations. So right. if the genetic profile maybe is not sensitive enough to pick out some of those, you know, differences uh, yeah. looking at other markers. Right. No, that, that definitely is some uh, one way we can uh, uh, look at we can look at this microbiome diversity and see maybe maybe we might find more something more uh, more distinct in these different populations. So that's yeah, it's really surprised about the lack of distinguishing uh, genetics between these populations. No, yeah, of course, especially because I mean a lot of these regions have uh, pretty extreme or pretty distinct um, environmental impacts. So you know, obviously, some being on the coast and you know, Placer and El Dorado is a very highly wooded area and whatnot. You're crossing that whole valley, so that whole central valley. So yeah, maybe looking at microbiome diversity would be something to check out. Thank you. I really like your work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have another question. I was wondering, are you planning on making a phylogeny with this uh, nice SNP data set you have now? Yes, I am in the process of learning how to do that. So, <laughs> yeah, um, actually, a lot, a lot of these programs, I, 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 uh, I have. So, all of my uh, research up to this point has been a lot of RNA sequencing and proteomics. So, learning these uh, DNA sequencing tools has been a completely different ballgame. So, I'm trying to figure out all these uh, genetic tools to do this work so that I can insert this as one of my chapters in my uh, dissertation. <laughs> cool. I look forward to seeing that tree when it's complete. All right. Let's see, any other last minute questions? Okay. 
Well, <clears throat> um, I think that's it then. Uh, both pre presenters did excellent jobs. You did really, really nice work and um, represented your labs very well. So let's see, Chris, did you want to add anything about the next PACVEC seminar? It'll be next week. And of course, Celia would have been more prepared, but I, I think it's December 14th. <laughs> Let me not say that wrong. Okay. Yes, what I have on my <laughs> calendar is December 14th. Certainly, we'll send out the announcements, but um, thank you all for coming. And Crystal, thank you for hosting.